the world tonight, meeting the conditions of Moran's bail, long-distance commutes for breast cancer patients, and Bill Clinton's cautious commitment to Bosnia. The World Tonight with Jane Gilbert, Peter Kent, and Susan Hay with the weather. Good evening. Guy Paul Morin is spending what could be his last night in jail. Late this afternoon, a judge approved bail conditions for the convicted murderer while he awaits an appeal of his case. Last summer, Moran was found guilty in the 1984 sex slaying of his nine-year-old Queensville neighbor, Christine Jessup. His lawyer expects him to be released from Kingston Penitentiary tomorrow. As Global News first reported, bail has been set at $120,000. Moran has been ordered to reside in Ontario with his parents and told to seek gainful employment. As well, he's prohibited from communicating with the Jessup family. And Morin is forbidden from having any dealings with people under 16 unless another adult is present. Those are just the main highlights. With more on the story, Global's Heather Hiscox reports tonight from Kingston. Lawyers for Guy Paul Moran say he's still happily reeling from the news his request for bail had been granted. He's reportedly packed and ready to go home to Queensville. Yesterday, a court of appeals judge made the unusual decision to release Moran from prison until his appeal, which will not likely be heard until 1995. Justice Marvin Katzman found many of the grounds for appeal arguable and said keeping Moran in prison is not necessary in the public interest. Earlier today, the father of murder victim Christine Jessup says he's still stinging from that ruling and his faith in the jury system has been shaken. They spent nine months of their time, of their life, uh, day in and day out, listening to what they had to listen to and informing an opinion. And it's basically gone for naught. Jessup's concern was echoed by the jurors who convicted Moran after Canada's longest murder trial. They say they now consider the trial a waste of time and are haunted that a convicted child killer is out on the street. Bob Jessup says it's the children who are being forgotten in all of this, not only his daughter Christine, but also the other children in Queensville. My God, when he was just an accused, there were children in that community that underwent psychiatric help. Now, here is a convicted killer out on bail pending an appeal, what are those children going to say? There are a few last details to be worked out before Moran can be released. The signatures have to be collected of the family and friends who've posted $120,000 bail. Those will then be approved by a justice of the peace, and the papers will be delivered by hand here to Kingston. It's expected Moran will be out of jail early tomorrow morning. Heather Hiscox, Global News, Kingston. Child molesters could soon find it more difficult to obtain parole. The Commons Justice Committee tabled a report today. That report says society needs to be better protected from pedophiles. In accepting the committee's recommendations, Solicitor General Doug Lewis expressed sympathy and promised action. Our senior parliamentary correspondent, John Burke, reports. The case of sex offender Ray Budrio caused such an outcry last year that the parole board decided to keep him behind bars in Kingston for another two years. Now a Commons committee in Ottawa is recommending tighter definitions to keep other pedophiles locked up longer. The uh, amendment that we're proposing makes it pretty clear. It's severe physical or severe psychological damage uh, that, that uh, you know, affects the victim. So uh, I think a judge... Uh, and a jury uh, would, would clearly understand what that, what that means. The Justice Committee chairman says his unanimous report should help protect society. I think it has to do with security of, of the Canadian public. Anyone who has children and grandchildren is severely concerned. A group called Victims of Violence has been lobbying the government for years to protect children from sexual offenses. Probably we'd rather see uh, a little bit more of a broader uh, definition of it than what they have but uh, again it's something uh, that could be looked at in the future but I think they're in the right track. Solicitor General Doug Lewis hopes to amend the law in the upcoming session. I think that we've got to move on this and try to, to you know protect society. The Solicitor General is also looking at extending jail sentences for dangerous criminals who have not been rehabilitated. But like today's parole recommendations for sexual offenders, the time is running out for this government to change complicated laws before the federal election. John Burke, Global News, Ottawa. The province is stepping up construction of a six-lane highway north of Toronto. But Ontario motorists eager to ride the new route are going to have to pay for the pleasure. Our Queen's Park Bureau Chief, Robert Fisher, explains. 
Another day and another announcement, the third this week for the Premier. This time it's highway expansion and improvement to the 416 in eastern Ontario, to the 401, Highway 69 to northern Ontario, the Queen Elizabeth Way and one other project. The government of Ontario plans to accelerate the building of Highway 407. Highway 407, now under construction, has been called the missing link in the province's highway system, an alternate east-west route to Highway 401, and a new source of revenue for the province. As a pilot project, toll booths similar to these will be established when the first section of the highway is completed in 1996. Drivers will pay a toll of between 50 cents and $3. In making the announcement, the Premier committed the government to dedicated tolls on the 407. Any toll money that is generated by those that are using 407, all of that money will be dedicated to accelerating the construction of 407. Later, Ray went even further with his commitment on tolls, saying the government won't impose them on existing roads and highways. I'm making it very clear, it's not our plan or our intention. Coupled with the announcement is a new government, let's make a deal philosophy. Ray says the government is funding highway projects in Ontario to accelerate their construction. But if the private sector thinks it can do it better and quicker, the Premier says the government is prepared to listen to any proposal. Robert Fisher, Global News, Brampton. Ontario's health care system and the new health minister, Ruth Greer, are under fire over a serious backlog in the treatment of women with breast cancer. Patients from the Toronto area are traveling hundreds of kilometers from home for radiation therapy. Greer says money is being freed up to improve the situation, but it will still be some time before the demand is met. Our health specialist Colleen Walsh reports. Breast cancer is the number one cause of cancer deaths in women in this country. One in nine will get breast cancer. More women are being diagnosed at early stages so that surgery doesn't have to be radical. Removal of the entire breast is not always necessary. A lumpectomy isolates the tumor, but radiation treatment has to follow. Radiation works by depositing energy in the cancer cells, preventing them from dividing. There is a shortage of machines, trained therapists to operate these machines, and radiation oncologists. There was an overwhelming belief that the need for radiation therapy would become less over time as there was more enthusiasm, let's say, for chemotherapy or biological therapies or new therapies for cancer. That, in fact, hasn't materialized. The need for radiation therapy hasn't gone away. It's remained not only the same, but in fact, more indications have become apparent. It's important to begin radiation therapy as soon after surgery as possible. Dr. Sutcliffe says on average the patient should be treated within six weeks, but the wait at some cancer centers is as long as 14 weeks. In that time, the cancer might recur or spread to other parts of the body. So hundreds of women from Metro Toronto are being sent to cancer centers here in Sudbury and Thunder Bay, where by sheer numbers, the demand is not as great. We have uh, what we call excess capacity in our machines, which allows us to treat more patients than we are currently treating. Therefore, we can take some of the excess from the Toronto area. We are addressing the backlog, and as I say, what has to happen in the interim is that this provincial resource of cancer treatment facilities be used provincially and people not delay getting treatment um, because it isn't available right where they live. The government wants all communities to be able to look after their own health concerns. Toronto will receive 10 new radiation machines by 1995 and active recruitment for radiation therapists is underway. But as the number of women getting breast cancer rises, centers all across the province will fill to capacity. Colleen Walsh, Global News, Toronto. And the issue of medical resources was also under discussion today at a meeting between Federal Health Minister Ben Wabouchard and representatives of various AIDS groups. The groups are asking Ottawa to boost funding for AIDS research and education. They're looking for an increase of about $18 million a year. Bouchard calls the request unrealistic. But as Jacques Bourbeau reports, the majority of Canadians disagree. Oh, I see. At the AIDS Committee of Ottawa, workers are packaging information that could save a life. These safe sex pamphlets will be distributed to gay men so they can learn how to protect themselves from the AIDS virus. A $50,000 federal grant helps pay for this outreach program, but the funding runs out next month, and the coordinator says he needs more money. If I get 50 grand again, we will do our best, but we will fall short again, just as we fell short before, because 50,000 was never adequate. 
The federal government now spends $37 million a year on AIDS research and education. But that program ends this March, and Ottawa must soon decide if it wants to spend more or less on AIDS. Today, four groups met with Health Minister Benoit Bouchard to plead for a boost in spending to $55 million a year. You can't just stop and say, well, it's over. Uh, we did it, and now we can uh, let go. That kind of behavior change is a lifelong process for those who have made the change, and it has to continue for new people entering the population at risk. Their caseloads are doubling, tripling, um, at times even much, much greater than that over the last six months to a year. So more and more people are coming in their doors, but their budgets don't get any greater. The health minister has compared AIDS funding to the money spent on breast cancer. AIDS groups say this is a dangerous argument. I think it's uh, wrong to imply that health funding is some kind of zero-sum game. As part of their lobbying effort, the AIDS groups brought along a new poll. It shows 72% of Canadians think AIDS funding should be a higher priority for Ottawa. After listening to these arguments, the health minister was doubtful he'll be able to find more money. $55 million. In light of the pressures we have on the system, I believe he is uh, unrealistic. In the past month, Benoit Bouchard has listened to numerous requests for more AIDS funding, including a recommendation from a House of Commons all-party committee. A final decision is expected early next month, but Bouchard is making it clear he doubts he'll be able to meet these requests for more money. Jopper Beau, Global News, Ottawa. The Clinton administration unveiled its first major foreign policy initiative today. It's a new American plan for Bosnia that may involve the use of troops. We'll have the details as the World Tonight continues. And for the second consecutive day, some East Coast scallop fishermen have stayed in port because of fierce winter storms. That story, coming up. It all began here. It's unthinkable. Jane Simpson made shortbread with lactansia margarine. Margarine? With lactansia buttermilk for a buttery taste like no other. Do the unthinkable. single day, thousands of people find it fast in just one place, the one and only Yellow Pages. Where are you finding it? Find it fast and take it easy in the one and only Yellow Pages by Teledirect. Let's compare our major competitors with Canadian Tire. They have licensed trained technicians. We have licensed trained technicians. They have high-tech equipment. So do we. They have nationwide guarantees. We have nationwide guarantees, too. But we would like to leave you with one final thought. Canadian Tire's prices are a lot more inviting. Canadian Tire, your number one choice for auto service. I have a blind date tonight, and you know what they say about first impressions. Do I reveal my nutritious, ready-for-commitment side with 100% whole wheat, or do I let loose the fun-loving Mr. Mini Wheat with my great-tasting light frosting? I really want her to like me. Then show her both sides, Mr. Mini Wheat. You think so? Yeah, show her everything a Mini Wheat from Kellogg's has got, and she'll be back for more. She'll never leave my side. Well, now, Mr. Mini Wheat. She'll be my true love forever. Oh. Let's not get carried away. It all began here. It's unthinkable. Jane Simpson made shortbread with lactansia margarine. Margarine? With lactansia buttermilk for a buttery taste like no other. Do the unthinkable. The United States has decided to join diplomatic efforts to end the bloodshed and killing in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Secretary of State Warren Christopher has appointed a special envoy to take part in United Nations-sponsored peace talks. Christopher said the U.S. is unwilling to use military force at the moment, but that if a peace plan is reached, American troops will help implement it. Our Washington correspondent, Carl Hanlon, reports. Efforts to end the brutal fighting in the former Yugoslavia have been on hold, waiting for the United States to take a position. The U.S. has now weighed in with some tough words against the Serbian ethnic cleansing, murders, rapes, and beatings. 
Our conscience revolts at the idea of passively accepting such brutality. And on behalf of President Clinton, Christopher unveiled a series of steps the U.S. will take, including appointing an envoy to take part in the United Nations search for peace, increased sanctions against Serbia, efforts to move humanitarian aid into the region, and if a peace accord is reached, the U.S. will help enforce it. I hope that uh, the parties will recognize and gain some confidence the fact that we are prepared to uh, use our military power to enforce the agreement. We think that the uh, involvement of the United States government and other international factors will secure a viable and lasting peace. The U.S. did not propose an alternative to the Owen Vance peace proposal that's being discussed at the United Nations. Instead, it plans to build on that process. However, the U.S. made it very clear it's not prepared to commit troops to trying to end the fighting at this point. The United States is not the world's policeman. We cannot interpose our forces to stop every armed conflict in the world. Yet we are the United States of America. We have singular powers and influence. International mediators Cyrus Vance and Lord Owen are welcoming the U.S. decision to get involved and back up a peace plan with force if one is reached. But for now, it appears nothing the U.S. has said will have an immediate impact on the fighting. Carl Hamlin, Global News, Washington. Arthur Ashe was laid to rest today in his hometown, Richmond, Virginia. The tennis champion died on Saturday of AIDS-related pneumonia. Thousands of people attended the funeral at the governor's mansion. Personalities from the world of sports and politics remembered Ashe as a man of courage and fortitude. Among the speakers, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, New York Mayor David Dinkins, and Ash's Davis Cup teammate, Stan Smith. And a Niagara Regional Police officer was laid to rest this morning. More than 600 officers from across Canada and parts of the United States took part in the service for 32-year-old Constable Jeff Polazzi. He was accidentally shot in the chest by a fellow officer last Saturday at a shooting range in Thorold. Polazzi was remembered as a dedicated officer and a family man. The province's Special Investigations Unit is probing the shooting. The captains of three scallop draggers based in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, decided not to sail for Georgia's bank today. The reason, a second straight day of bad weather conditions. Fifty or so fishermen refused to leave the wharf yesterday, even though they were threatened with dismissal. They've been reluctant to sail since the dragger Cape Aspie sank late last month. Five men died in that sinking. Our Atlantic correspondent, Michael Chisholm, reports. The scallop draggers are still tied up at the wharves along Lunenburg's waterfront. Two days ago, the company that owns these boats ordered their ships to sea. But with a forecast for heavy winds and freezing spray, crews refused to go. Today, the ships were again scheduled to leave. But when crews arrived for work, the company had changed its mind. The, the decision, as the company uh, says, uh, is left up to the skipper. So the skippers decided the, this morning that the uh, weather forecast hadn't changed all that much since yesterday, so they opted to uh, not to sail today. Crews are afraid of this, freezing spray. Two weeks ago, during a storm at sea, ice built up on another dragger. The Cape Aspey caused that ship to capsize. Eleven men were rescued. Five fishermen lost their lives. It's the memory of what happened to those men that has these fishermen worried. With the Cape Aspey going down, it puts a lot of things in a person's mind. Uh, it's really hard. It's, it's hard on everybody. It really brings to light, you know, what could really happen. And it really makes you think. Nervous. Everybody's nervous now. Everybody's going to be really nervous for a long time. I don't know if we'll ever get over what happened here two weeks ago. With another winter storm raging at sea, the decision not to sail was welcomed by Lunenburg fishermen, who have long complained fishing companies are more interested in profits than safety. We're not after power or victory. We just want uh, people to recognize us and give us a little say in the matter. Like, it's our lives at stake when we go aboard them boats. Last week, fishermen sent a petition to Ottawa asking that the scallop fishery be closed at this dangerous time of the year. 
But John Crosby says that's not a matter for his department. These decisions had to be left to the experienced people who are participating in the industry. There, there, there can be danger at any time of the year. Fishermen say it's likely they'll head back to sea as early as Friday or next Monday. And with sea conditions expected to change for the better, fishermen are hoping for a better trip than the one that claimed the lives of five of their friends. Michael Chisholm, Global News, Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. Nothing quite so foul on our uh, forecast horizon, Susan Hay. A little sunshine tomorrow, but it's going to be windy, and because of the winds, uh, wind chill values running high tomorrow in certain sections of Ontario. All right, we'll watch for that in the forecast in just a few minutes' time uh, when Susan returns. And a new twist on the issue of support payments. A woman in St. Catharines takes her adult children to court to get them to support her. Stay with us. The love seat goes here, and my new entertainment center goes over there. As soon as I get my income tax refund. Why wait for your money? Get it fast with H&R Block's cash back service. We'll do all the paperwork. We'll calculate and discount your refund and have your check in your hands fast. And there's no extra charge for preparing your return. The choice is easy. Unless, of course, you like waiting. Cash back exclusively from H&R Block to get your money fast. Yeah, right. In our little car? We already get great mileage. No way. How? Formula Shell will take us further. How much further? Now that's what I call mileage. Are all fabric softeners the same, or does one of the leading brands leave towels much softer? The difference is quite amazing. Just watch. One, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. Which fabric softener was it that gave the thickest, fluffiest softness? That's right, Downy. Because put to the test, Downy softens best. Introducing a whole new silky softness. New, softer, silkier Royale. It's always been hidden soft. But now, thick two-ply Royale has a softer, silkier feel than before. New, softer, silkier Royale. Conditions are slippery this evening just north of Metro Toronto due to some patchy freezing drizzle and temperatures continue to de decrease tonight. We also have some light snow mixed with rain near Lake Erie. Other than that, it's just generally cloudy in the south and quite clear and very cold across the rest of Ontario. Well, on tomorrow's map, we're dealing with this ridge of high pressure. So areas uh, to the north, central and off to the east will be sunny. When you wake in further south, a cloudy first thing in the morning, and then we should get into a mix of sun and cloud by the afternoon. But areas in the extreme southwest uh, keeping cloudy sky due to this disturbance and maybe some light snow around Windsor tomorrow and flurries off of uh, Lake Ontario, mainly Hamilton due to the northeast winds. Now, brisk northeast winds right across the province tomorrow, anywhere from 30 to 50 kilometers per hour, so wind chill values will be running high, but at least we'll have a little bit of sunshine out there and any snow or flurries uh, really will not accumulate to very much. Now, tomorrow's readings across Ontario, anywhere from minus 14 to about minus 8 degrees for the north and central areas, and then further south and off to the east, minus 11 to about minus 2, feeling more like minus 20 or minus 25 across Ontario. So it's a good thing we're going to have a little bit of blue sky. Here's a closer look at the next four days. So Tim and Sudbury North Bay, Sault Ste. Marie and Elliott Lake. Sunny and colder Thursday. Northeast winds to about 20. 
minus 11 to minus 14 degrees, and that's just a base reading. Now, eastern Ontario, mainly sunny and much colder. Strong winds to at least 30 kilometers per hour. Highs minus 9 to about minus 11 degrees. The district of Muskoka to include Halliburton and Barrie. Sunshine and a cold day tomorrow. Winds will be out of the northeast and the high there around minus 10. Windsor and London, Sarnia and Chatham. Windy and colder, mainly cloudy with the chance of light snow in the extreme southwest. Wind speeds between 40 and 50 kilometers per hour. Highs anywhere from minus 2 to minus 5. Now in Metro Toronto, because of the northeast winds, flurries possible off of Lake Ontario. Sunshine by the afternoon with a high there of minus 5. But as I mentioned, right across this province tomorrow, feeling more like minus 20 to minus 25. A little bit of sunshine, but a slow start for the south. All right. Thanks so much, Susan. You're welcome. Finally tonight, it is not uncommon for courts to order estranged parents to pay child support. But a ruling by an Ontario court judge has done just the opposite. Sean Mallon explains. The decision was handed down by a judge in St. Catharines. 58-year-old Veronica Godwin launched the case, invoking a rarely used section of the Family Law Act. She won a total of $1,000 a month in support payments from her four grown children. The three daughters and one son are aged 34 through 39. They have been estranged from their mother for years. They told the court that she had physically and emotionally abused them in their youth. They all left home by age 20 and paid their own way through university. In ruling against them, the judge said that the standards of parental care might have been lower than we expect today, but not unusual for the 1950s and 60s. He noted in his written decision that the law only requires the mother to prove she had provided a minimum amount of care or support. I think that this is very far-reaching and... Herschel Fogelman the, represented the children. I think it's a hardship emotionally. I think they feel as if they've been, you know, they were, they were abused. They feel they were abused as children, and now they feel they're being abused again. The mother's lawyer says she needs help because she has only been able to find work as a live-in caregiver for an elderly person, a job that pays $9,000 a year. He disputes the children's claim of abuse. Quite frankly, the judge did not believe them, and he ruled that the mother had provided reasonable care under all the circumstances. Sider says as far as he knows, only Ontario and B.C. have family law provisions for parents to seek court orders for support from children. But the numbers of older people are growing in our society, and the head of a lobby group for them thinks the publicity from this case might cause a lot of people to consider court action. If the kids don't know enough to help without being pushed, then maybe they have to be pushed. I reject the idea that there will be a floodgate of cases of this nature. Most families take care of their own. The children will be appealing the decision, and they'll try to get an interim order so that they don't have to make payments in the meantime. Those payments, by the way, are not covered by the Income Tax Act, so they cannot be claimed as a deduction. Sean Mallon, Global News, St. Catharines. And that's our report for Wednesday. For all of us on The World Tonight, I'm Peter Kent. And I'm Jane Gilbert. We'll see you again tomorrow for the 6 o'clock report. Sportsline is next with Jim Taddy and Don Martin. Good night. Good night. Good night.